Good morning, Facebook. Good morning all. It's a wonderful day to worship in the house of the Lord. So glad you're all with us today. <laughs> Good morning, Joyce. Let's all stand together, please. Let's all sing together as soon as we have some music going on.
We welcome you this morning. We're glad you're here at River Valley Christian Church. Thanks to everyone joining us online. And uh, um, this is our first Sunday of December, so we're going to do some uh, Christmas songs today. Hope you join in and give praise for the one who is our everything, even Jesus. Let's, uh, let's go to him in prayer and uh, let's worship him today. Father, we give you thanks for Jesus the Christ. We thank you, Lord, for our salvation purchased with his very own blood. Lord, may this day be dedicated to you. May we lift your uh, praises that they might be glorious in your ears. Father, And uh, though we can never praise you like you're worthy of, Lord, may it be a blessing to you today as your church sings uh, to the glorious, wonderful God. Lord, uh, we thank you for the blessings today. May we be a blessing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Watch this. Come see you. My mama told me something when I was growing up that has forever changed my life. She played the piano at our little church at 3rd and Pine Street for 37 years. She tried to teach me to play the piano. <laughs> but I wasn't very good. She would teach me the names of the notes, what a major key is, what a minor key is. She tried to teach me musical theory, but I was just bored. <laughs> then one day, she told me that the best news in the world is found by playing a simple scale on the piano. I had no idea what she meant, so she told me to play an eight note scale. So I did. I said, how is that good news? And she said, I played it incorrectly and that I needed to play it the other way. So I did. Again, I said, how is that good news? And she said, I played it the right way, but I needed to add the pauses. The pauses? She said, the pauses. Add them on the first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. Now I was frustrated and said, how can eight notes with random pauses be the best news in the world? Then I got up, walked away, and went outside. Frankly, I didn't care what she was talking about. I didn't like playing the piano anyway. Well, years later, my mama got sick and passed away. As I was thinking about her, I remember what she told me about the piano. Not only that, I still remember the notes she told me to pause. The first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. So I sat down at her piano and played the scale with the pauses. Yeah. 
Amen.
can't save ourselves. We can't save one another. One sinner can't save another sinner. We're not an acceptable sacrifice to even die in someone else's place as far as salvation is concerned. Only the acceptable Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God, can take that position, that place, that role. Jesus, God in, his, God in His compassion for us, God in His love for human beings, and God in His love for you, ordained that Jesus would go to a cross and die for us before the foundations of this world. And the Bible tells us the story of Jesus is one of the Redeemer, one of the sacrificial lamb who gave himself so that you can live. Let's not take that for granted today as we meet around the Lord's table and partake of these elements, symbols of Christ's body and blood given for us. Let's go to him in prayer. And let's, let's put it. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what these emblems that we partake of symbolize. Christ's body and blood given for us. May we treasure that. May we never take it for granted or treat it as passe, commonplace. It may be the most holy thing in the world. Lord, thank you for Jesus. As we partake today, we pray in Jesus' name. of where people have said, mark my word. A coach might say, mark my word, he won't play the last quarter of this game. A graduate might say, mark my word, you'll remember my name. A boyfriend might say, mark my word, you won't regret saying yes to marrying me. <laughs> A friend might say, mark my word, your son, your daughter will go far one day. A counselor might say, mark my words, if you don't stop abusing them, they will leave you. And an ex-wife might say, mark my words, you can't make me jealous. If he was worth keeping, I'd still be with him. <laughs> If you say mark my words to someone, you're emphasizing that you're believing what they're speaking is going to happen. It's going to be true and it's for your good. Somewhere between the cleansing of the temple for the second time after the triumphal entry 
and before the upper room with the 12 disciples, Jesus is uh, giving a message that essentially says, mark my words. This will happen. And the first thing he said would happen is found in chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple. He was walking away with his disciples. They came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. And Jesus said, do you see all these things? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in all of Jerusalem. Do you realize the secular history tells us within 40 years that was fulfilled? The beautiful temple of Jerusalem of marble and gold was completely demolished by the conquering Roman army led by Titus in 70 A.D. Secular history teaches that. Christian history teaches it. Uh, Art Hoven, who once wrote for the Lookout Lesson, said, Eusebius wrote that the whole body of the church in Jerusalem left before the final siege began. Apparently the Christians realized the sign Jesus gave them, fled to the mountains, and they avoided the destruction of Jerusalem. Praise God when they heard what Jesus said. They believed it was true. They acted on it, and it became for their good. And so I want you to know, whenever someone says, mark my word, and especially if it's Jesus, it's going to be true, and it will be beneficial. Matthew 24, again, <coughs> is situated between the time Jesus cleansed the temple and Jesus even went on the cross. They didn't understand if this was Tuesday or Wednesday that on Friday he was going to be on the cross at Calvary. But in between this time, he, he said, here's some powerful things. I want you to mark my word. Will happen. And you're going to have to face them and be prepared. Look at book, verse 23. As Jesus left the temple, now he's sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately. They said, tell us, when will this, and then I believe that's the temple thing, happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And these disciples had inquiring minds and they just wanted to know. Jesus said, mark my word. I'm going to tell you some truth. But if you listen, it will protect you. Billy Graham boiled down the uh, words of chapter 24 to five terms. Watch, wait, wake up. I'm sorry, watch, walk, wake up, wait, and work. And I'll try to get through those here today. First, Jesus said, watch. And I want us to do that carefully, that no one deceive you about when he's going to come again. Adrian Rogers, another great preacher, he drew these terms that Jesus taught into words that I think paint a great picture, a sign for us to know when Christ is coming again. He's coming. The end is near. And the first sign is deception of counterfeit Christ. You see that in verses 40, uh, 4 and 5. Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and many will deceive. And so Jesus said, one sign of the end of times is that there will be false teachers everywhere. I just want to ask, do you ever get a sense that there are false teachers on television, radio, social media, in schools, that are teaching that which would not be in agreement with God's word. 
Paul told Timothy in the first century, 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, For there will be a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn their thoughts toward myths. You see, truth will not be spoken. Cults will dramatically increase in number. And in the past 50 years alone, there have been over a thousand who at one time claimed they were a Messiah. Do you get the impression that we're nearing the time Jesus comes again? Just realize there's going to be the deception of counterfeit Christ. And the best protection against Satan's lie is to know God's truth. And be prepared when you hear the lie. Secondly, the, the sign that you ought to look for is the division and continuing conflict. Verses 6 and 7. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. It's been noted that maybe over 6,000 years of history, we have lost over 600 million people in a conflict on this earth. Since 1900, we've had two world wars. At the end of 2003, there were 15 major wars underway, and there have been at least 20 since then. Do you understand that contrary to the dreams of the enlightened and the empty promises of secular teachers, man is not getting better and better. We're only getting better and learning how to fight and even kill one another. I believe we've got a sign that coming is near. Another sign Jesus spoke is disasters of cataclysmic consequence. There will be global challenges, verses 7 and 8. Jesus said there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus said in the days before he returns, there will be famines. When you look at the passage in Luke 21, where Jesus is teaching, Luke adds that Jesus included, there will be pestilences. And then Matthew says, and Luke agrees, there will be earthquakes in various places. How many of us in our lifetime have seen famines? How many of us have seen the pictures of emaciated children or desperate Jewish people who are looking for food because there's famine in their land? It moves us to action. But when we see that, we ought to know the end is near. In the 50s, we faced polio. In later decades came AIDS, Ebola, SARS. In the last two years, we have faced the pestilence of the coronavirus. Not only that, earthquakes have increased over 2,000% since 1492 when Columbus said the ocean blew. The world is shaking. And it's just reminding us, Jesus is coming soon. You know, every time my wife hears that there's been an earthquake, she reminds me, Kevin, Jesus is coming soon. I think about that, and I just wonder if she thinks I need to get my house in order. <laughs> when you have that earthquake, would you tell your loved ones, Jesus is coming soon? And be sure they know they ought to get their house in order. Amen. Jesus did say the famines and pestilence <laughs> and earthquakes are the beginning of the earth's birth pains. I like what Max Lucada said. He, he said the term birth pains, we men are not qualified to define. 
And he said, I get that. I wouldn't even try. Then he said, I have it on good authority that birth pains are painful and they will come with increasing frequency as the time draws near. And Jesus compared famines and pestilence and earthquakes to birth pains that are painful. And how many of us have seen the debris of great loss from any of those? And they come with increasing frequency in the days that we even now live. And I believe it's just a sign that a big event is pretty near. Sign number four. Jesus indicates there will be an increase in defamation of committed Christians. Listen to verse 9. Jesus is speaking. Here's what he's telling his disciples. This would not be a great recruitment tool. And it may not be if you're here for the first time. A great thing for you to hear. But I want you to know with Christ we can endure. But he told those who were following him just days before the cross, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And I don't know if you've noticed, but you know, the world allows a lot of religions to peacefully exist. But if you are a believer in Jesus, they want to tap that down. They even said from the beginning chapters of Acts, when the church began in Jerusalem, you stop preaching that message of Jesus. They put him in prison. James was beheaded. The first martyr. Others have been crucified and worse. Voice of the martyrs contends that more Christ followers have been killed for their faith in this last century than all the other centuries combined. There's persecution of Christians in the world today. And it is Christians who often are at the wrath of those who don't believe. Persecution of Christians will increase. But sadly with that, the number of devoted followers of Christ will decrease. Thou quit following Jesus. And Billy Graham in his heyday, he said this, he said, mark my word. The day is coming when it's going to cost to live for Jesus Christ. And we are more and more a minority. And that's exactly what it was like in the first century. Mark my word. You can count it. If you say you're following Jesus, you will have some opposition and it will increase. But it's a sign Jesus is coming again. Sign number five, there will be a company distortions from Christless courts. The righteous will be affected by false doctrines in the world. Verse 11, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. I remember in my day, uh, there was uh, a movement uh, when I was in college uh, of what they called moonies. And Sun Young Moon uh, prophesied that Jesus failed when he went to the cross and uh, he fell short of God's goal to become the savior of the world. And Sun Young Moon was the Messiah and thousands and even hundreds of thousands were married in mass ceremonies and followed him for years. There will be false prophets who deceive many. The world embraces claims that God is revealed in Buddhism and Krishna and in Muhammad and a conglomerate of other religions you could call by name. C.K. Chesterton pointed out when a man ceases to believe in the one true God, it doesn't mean that he will believe in nothing. It only means he can't believe in anything. Oh, how the church needs to hear that song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. And at Christmas, we have a door wide open that we can do that. And I want to thank the church 
for investing their time and their, their efforts to try to get children of the next generation to know of Christ and the joy of following here, him that we had here last night. Sign number six, display of carnal coldness. Verse 12, the righteous will be affected by wickedness. In verse 12, Jesus said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Do you, do you think there is a coldness in the world today about the, the, the morality that God through Christ and the scriptures teach? Wouldn't you agree there is an increased acceptance to kill babies, perform homosexual marriages, euthanize terminally ill or aged, and to even decriminalize crime? Wickedness will abound. People begin to reject all kinds of authority. What used to be called evil, they call good. And they try to eradicate all elements of God's law from life. And they use it the barometer for what we ought to do is how they feel. And one day they feel this, and another day they feel that. And it is something that is ever-changing. When false teachers remove God's moral base foundation in our life, people become cold. And, and they're not kind to one another. They're harsh. But worse, Jesus predicts that Sunday morning churchgoers will vacate even going to a Bible teaching church. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for listening to God through Christ and His Word today. What I think when Jesus says, mark my words, it's true. He wants you to believe it. If you follow it, it's for your good. There'll be coldness in the world, and it's a sign of the end of times. Jesus is coming again. But sign number seven is, here's something hopeful, the discharge of Christ's commission. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Billy Graham did a great uh, job getting the gospel to go globally. He took it to many corners in the world. But there are those who say there are yet as many as 1,300 dialects, ethnic groups that don't have the Bible in their language today. So we still have much work to do. Jesus commissioned us to take the gospel to every nation. We could use crusades, we could use radio, we can use television. There are books, there are tapes, there's leaflets, there's the internet. There's a lot of ways we can get the gospel out to the world. And even in this time of pandemic when we believe the end was coming near, we chose the technology of Facebook Live to make sure that if you couldn't get them here, we could go to you. Amen. Amen. Because we believe we are to discharge Christ's word to every nation, to any person who would ever hear and then believe. I do believe God is moving in the world today. There are places where the, the church is blossoming under great oppression. People say that the church in China, with all that we hear that is oppressive there, is the strongest church in any nation of the world. They're underground. They're worshiping privately, but they're strong in Christ. While we yet have freedom, let's not, not forsake the assembly of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. Let's gather that we might continually feed ourselves and encourage others and discharge this challenge to go worldwide with the story of Jesus. Because once it does get to every corner of the world, then Jesus says that's the sign Amen. that he is coming again. 
My question is, there are seven signs we have identified. If we held them up to you and we reminded you weekly, would you follow the signs? And would you believe the end is near? I heard the story of two fellows that had been fishing by a nearby river. And as they came back, uh, they made a sign. And the sign said, the end is near. Turn yourselves around now before it's too late. And they held up that sign to everyone passing by, hoping they would see it. The first car that passed by didn't appreciate the sign. The driver rolled the window down, shouted at the two men, Would you leave us alone, you religious nuts? And they zoomed past the sign. And all of a sudden, the two fellows holding the sign heard a big splash. <laughs> and they looked at each other and said, do you think we should have written on the sign, Bridge Out Ahead? <laughs> <clears throat> if you heard and saw a sign, the end is near, would you pay attention? Or would you dismiss it to your own demise? I want to challenge you today just days before Jesus went to the cross to read the signs. I believe they are true and they are for your benefit. And verse 13 says, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Amen. Amen. None of those signs are good signs except for the gospel going globally. Would you stay faithful because the end is near? If you do, there's a lasting promise. And yet we see in those signs the world may collapse, but the work for Christ will endure. So there's not a one of us who want to give up. And along the way, we ought to watch carefully that no one deceives you. That's my first point. But I'm going to wrap up the other a little quicker. Billy Graham said, watch carefully. Then he said, walk cautiously. Remember that little song, Be Careful Little Eyes, What You See, yeah. What You Hear, What You Believe, Where You Go. Paul defined a Christian as one who turned from idols to serve the living God. Listen to what Jesus said in verse 23. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, here he or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs, false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. They wanted to deceive even God's people. See, I've told you ahead of time. So, if anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out there. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So, if anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. There will be false statements of Christ in the world, but there is only one, and it is Jesus the Christ who came from Nazareth, who died on Calvary. And he says, don't listen to others and other ways to be saved, for the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful. Little eyes, what you see, what you hear, what you do. Where do you go? Three, wake up soberly. Jesus used a lesson from a fig tree. Learn from the fig tree. It's summer, but it's coming soon. Verse 32, I learned this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know the summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near. The end of time is near. It's right at the door. And then he said, verse 34, Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things happen. You're going to see. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so he's telling these first century followers, don't sleep. Wake up to what's happening. Wake up. The end of the times is nearer than you know. 
Then number four, wait wide-eyed continually. The time is due. It's already appointed by the Father. Verse 42, therefore keep watch because you do not know it what hour your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Matthew Henry said this, though Jesus tarry beyond our time, he will not tarry past the time he is due. And the Father knows when that time is that he is due. And I like what A.T. Robertson says, it is useless to set the day and hour for Christ's coming, but it is folly to neglect it is happening soon. Billy Graham said, watch, walk, wake up, wait. And then the last thing he said about Matthew 24 was, work until he comes. And that's why you're here today. Work faithfully because we better be busy when he does return. Look at what Jesus said. He essentially says, mark my word. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master will put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. God wants to come again, but he wants to find us working as if he wasn't yet coming. He wants us to work until he comes again. And yet we don't know when that hour is. But he'll reward the faithful by letting them serve him even more so in heaven. I just kind of wonder... Is that what Dad's doing now in the presence of the Lord? Amen. We'll get through everything this world throws at us, and then it'll come again. But it's not going to be painless. It won't be quick. God will use the mess of this world to let us be messengers of a loving God mm. who is coming again. Amen. Mark my word, when Jesus, Jesus left finally the presence of his disciples, remember what Jesus said? And I will be with you always to the end of the age. What a great hope. He's going to be with us till he comes again. On our trip back from Missouri, if you want to stand with me, go ahead and stand. Ken, if you want to go ahead and come. On our trip back from Missouri last week from Thanksgiving with my daughter, her wife, uh, my daughter, her husband, and my granddaughter, my wife reminded me of a story of something that happened with Jamie. Back when Jamie was four or five, Jamie heard this song and she would sing it and we would play it in the car. And the lyrics are, people get ready, Jesus is coming, soon we'll be going home. And it was just a lively little kids chorus that she gravitated to and we played it and we sang and she would sing that to the top of her lungs. And what Lee reminded me was one day Jamie had an appointment in the Christmas time to go to her pediatrician for just a checkup and doctor called her into the office and there was Christmas music playing and the doctor was talking with Jamie and 
finally he would say, well, do you know who's coming soon? And Jamie goes, yes, Jesus. <laughs> and he said, that doctor was just got off guard. <laughs> we need to teach the children of God. Jesus is coming soon. Or at this time of year, we need to celebrate. He has already come, but he's coming back. And it ought to be a season of joy. Yes. But we've got work to do until Jesus comes again. I like what Max and Cato says. He said, Bethlehem was just the beginning. I call Jesus' next appearance, Bethlehem Act Two. <laughs> there will be no silent night this time. Instead, the skies will open and trumpets will blast and a new kingdom will begin that lasts forever. And the celebration of God and His Son will be eternal. Amen. Will you be ready, church? Do you believe this is true? Yes. Will you follow it personally? Will you tell that to your family? Will you bring your whole family along and celebrate not only the coming of Christ here at Christmas, but the second coming for us who he finds faithfully working until that time? I offer an invitation to you to follow Jesus as the Christ. If you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, I pray that you would believe that Jesus born that we celebrate at Christmas is the Messiah, is the Son of God, did, after he taught these words, get arrested, paid an unjust price of his life on the cross for our sin, then was buried, but God raised him from the dead on the third day. And that gives us hope that anybody's death who believes in God and his son Jesus, they too will rise again. And that's the hope I have of my father. That's the hope we should have individually and trust that will happen to us. That when we face death, that will be our hope and our experience. If you believe that, would you repent of sin now? Would you turn to God? Would you confess that Jesus is the Christ? Would you be baptized if you've never been baptized? Then would you work for the Lord, saying, I'm so grateful that he saved me from my sins. I'm just so happy that I get a chance to serve him until he comes again or until I die. You need a home church. We pray you consider walking with us as we walk with Jesus. We ask you right now, would you come? Would you confess your faith in Jesus? Would you be baptized? Would you confess your faith in Jesus? Know that you're saved, but you need partners. Would you choose River Valley? That's what we invite you to right now. Please come if you want to make a decision like that.
right behind. Amen. Uh, pray for the Brian Ringer family. That's a sudden issue in our community. Brian and his family did come to church here when we first got started, and then a daughter got married, and then they went up to a nearby church closer where uh, the daughter's husband attended. And so that just happens in ministry and life. But you pray for Brian and his family. Uh, just a little sudden issue of bad health that took him to the presence of the Lord. Father, would you uh, use us, this church, to uh, serve you till you come again. Yes. Uh, Father, we do think the, uh, the earth is shaking and the birth pains are coming. The intensity is increasing. Uh, but I pray that even if we face opposition till you come or before you come, we'll stay faithful. We'll keep working, even if we have to go underground. But I thank you for the freedom we have. I thank you for these loyal followers of you. I thank you for these joyful followers of you. And I just thank you uh, that you use us in your kingdom here on earth till you come again. Father, uh, may we celebrate your son's birth. May we celebrate his coming again. May we tell that news to all who will listen. May they believe it's true. And may they know it's beneficial. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Facebook family. Thank you for worshiping with us. Have a wonderful, awesome week. If you can, come and be with us in, uh, in person next Sunday at 10 a.m. at River Valley Christian Church. If you can't, please come back here and worship with us on Facebook Live. Have a great and wonderful week.